If you would, open with me this evening to Ezekiel chapter 1. We're going to uh, begin this evening looking through the uh, book of Ezekiel and noticing the uh, lessons that are there for us as uh, God's people, the parallels and the uh, principles that the prophet Ezekiel uh, gave as he was preaching to the children of Israel in captivity because we live in a world and in a time where people are in captivity to sin. And when we see how Ezekiel preached to the children of Israel who are in captivity, in Babylonian captivity, because of their rebellion against God, then we certainly will see a great deal for us in how to deal with sin, how to react to God, how to live in fellowship with God. And it's interesting as we begin examining the book of Ezekiel that we, we find Ezekiel uh, in captivity. He was taken in the second carrying away of Babylonian captivity about in 587. And in that second carrying away, the uh, Babylonians took the uh, common people. They still left uh, some in Jerusalem, but they had already taken the, uh, what we might say, the upper class of uh, Jerusalem society. And that's where we find Daniel being taken into captivity. And so Daniel had already been in captivity by the time that Ezekiel was taken into captivity with the second carrying away. And as the book opens, we find him by the river Kibar with the captives. It says, Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were opened. And I saw visions of God. And as we open the book of Ezekiel, and, and we see Ezekiel beginning his work with the children of Israel, with, with the people of God that had been taken into captivity because of their rebellion against God, it is uh, very significant to recognize that Ezekiel begins, or the, the first... Uh, uh, vision that, that Ezekiel receives is a vision of the glory of God because he's going to be preaching to the children of Israel in captivity who had forgotten about their glorious God, who had forgotten what God was to them and what they were supposed to be to God. And so he begins with this visions of God. You drop down to verse 28 of Ezekiel chapter 1, and it says, Like the appearance of a rainbow and a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And so what is the, the vision that we read between verse 1 and between verse 28? Well, he says there, it's visions of God. It's visions of the glory of God. And so this vision, what we read in chapter 1, has the singular purpose of magnifying the glory of God. And we want to go through it just quickly this evening and see what is in this vision. You know... I have heard all kinds of things about this first vision and the prophecy of Ezekiel. And I've even heard people say that, you know, the, there's the, the wheels and the, the wheel within the wheel, and that's talking about UFOs, and, and here's UFOs in the Bible, and it doesn't have anything at all to do with the glory of God. When we see what he says in verse 1, visions of God, 
When we see what he says in verse 28, visions of the glory of God, the glory of Jehovah, he says there, then that will help us understand what it is he's talking about, what it is he's seeing in these visions. And something else to keep in mind too is that this is a vision written down. And so the words that are written here are to paint a picture, to, to, to paint a picture in our minds so that we can learn from it and see something about the glory of God. And while we will go through the individual aspects of the picture, we need to keep in mind also not to get carried away with the minute details. Because it's, it's like a painting that you see on a wall. And when you look at the painting from, from a distance, you can see it and, and you admire the beauty of the painting. You admire the, the uh, technicality of the painting and, and, and you're getting the, the overall beauty of the picture, looking at it from back. But then you can get up close to it and you can examine it in more minute detail. And you can, you can see maybe the kind of brush strokes that the artist used or, or the, the medium that the, the artist used. Is it pencil? Is it pen? Is it watercolor? <clears throat> but getting up close to it and examining that minute detail should never take away from stepping back and looking at the whole picture and getting the lesson of the whole picture. And so we want to keep that in mind as we go through, because we are going to get up, as it were, close to the picture and look at some of the detail. But we want to keep the whole picture in front of us all the time. And remember that no matter how detailed we get in our examination, the point of the picture is to exalt the glory of God. <clears throat> as we begin looking at this visions of the glory of God in Ezekiel chapter 1, we see, first of all, the uh, four cherubim. And these four cherubim show the glory of God shining through His servants. The glory of God shines through His servants. You see uh, the uh, cherubim described there beginning in verse 5. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces, and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings and their, uh, on their four sides. And each of, their, uh, each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each had uh, the each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces, their wings stretched upward. Two wings of each one touched one another, and two covered their bodies. And each one went straight forward. They went wherever the Spirit wanted to go, and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. And so we see there these, these four living creatures described, these four cherubim you see over in Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 1, where Ezekiel sees these same four living creatures, and he says there in Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 1, And I looked, and there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone having the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And so here in Ezekiel chapter 10, he refers to them as cherubim. 
here in chapter 1, these four living creatures. The cherubim, the, the four living creatures, the, the uh, uh, angels of God were His servants. It says in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, when, when the apostle John is receiving the revelation, he says that a mighty angel came and showed him these things. Showed him the things that he wrote down in the book of Revelation. And just uh, to kind of throw in uh, something about the book of Revelation, Ezekiel is one of the keys to understanding Revelation. If you, if you go through Ezekiel and you understand the, the uh, visions that are there in Ezekiel, then when you go to Revelation, you see many of the same images being used in Revelation. If you know what they mean in Ezekiel, then you can understand what they mean in Revelation. So Ezekiel is one of the keys to understanding Revelation. And here in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, when the apostle John had been overwhelmed with the, the uh, appearance of this mighty angel that came to reveal to him the revelation. It says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. So this is John falling down at the feet of the angel that brought him the revelation to worship this angel. And it says that the angel said to John, See that you do not do that. And it's an exclamation. In the Greek, it's a very strong exclamation. The angel was angry with John and said, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. Look at what the angel says to John there. John was wrong to worship the angel because the angel wasn't God. The angel was a fellow servant of God. And so these, these cherubim, the, the angels that we see referred to in Scripture, they are fellow servants with the people of God, not to be worshipped. He says, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and, your, and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Uh, over in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 9, this, this must have been some impressive being. Because even after the angel tells John, see that you do not do that, he does it again in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 9. It says, then he said to me, see that you do not do that. Again, the second time. For I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And so when we see the description of these four living creatures, we're seeing a description that is of fellow servants of God. And so the, 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 the point there in the description of the cherubim, is that God's glory shines through His servants. Notice in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 5, and from within it. Now let me back up to verse 4. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud, notice it, with raging fire engulfing itself. And brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its mist the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. And so where do the four living creatures come out? When Ezekiel sees the four living creatures, they're coming out of this brightness. They're coming out of this fire. It says that they came out from the midst of the brightness that is God's glory. And so God's glory was reflected through them. They, they, were, they were a representation of God's glory. We, as fellow servants, are supposed to be reflections of God's glory. It says over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, Clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And so Christians, the servants of God, God's people, 
are supposed to be like letters, like epistles of Christ, so that people can read us and they can see something about the glory of God reflected in us. When Christians are persecuted, it says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16 that we should never be ashamed when we suffer as Christians. Because we're exemplifying the example of Christ. We're, we're representatives of Christ. That's what the word Christian means. One who belongs to Christ. And so we're representatives of Christ. And over in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 10, it says there, To the intent that now the manifest wisdom of God might be made known by the church, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at what Paul says about the church there. See, just as these four living creatures coming out of the fire, coming out of God's glory, and, and reflecting, we'll see in just a minute, reflecting that, that brightness through them. It is the responsibility of God's servants, the church today, to make known, according to the Apostle Paul, to make known the manifold wisdom of God. To show the manifold wisdom of God to the world. And so, we are like those uh, cherubim. We are their fellow servants of God that should be reflecting the glory of God in our service to Him. Back in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 13, you see not only they came out of the fire, they, they came out of the brightness that is God's glory, but the fire was in them, it says. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. They were bright, they were shining. That, that, that glory of God that they came out of was shining out of them. Like the appearance of torches. Look at that. These servants of God were like torches that were shining the glory of God. Going back and forth among the living creatures, the fire was bright and out of the fire went lightning. The brightness of the fire represents God's glory. It says in verse 27 of Ezekiel chapter 1, And from the appearance of His waist and upward, I saw as it were the color of amber and the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of His waist and downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire with brightness all around. That brightness of fire is referring to the shining glory of God. And yet, here it is shining forth from His servants. The, God's glory shines through us when we serve Him to His glory. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Isn't that what that's talking about? Isn't that the same thing it's talking about with those cherubim and, and, and shining like burning coals of fire? That the glory of God was shining out of them. And, and Jesus says that's what happens when we do His good works. It says, let your light so shine before men like those burning coals of fire when we work the work of God, when we serve Him to His glory. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In John chapter 15 and verse 8, it says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. See, there's those fellow servants of God. And how is God glorified? When we let His glory shine through us. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, 
The Apostle Paul writes there concerning the responsibility of the servants of God to shine His glory forth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, he says, For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You were bought at a price with the precious blood of Christ, it says in 1 Peter chapter 1. And so having been bought at a price, we are His servants and we glorify Him by the way that we live. We, we let His glory shine through us. And isn't that a, a, a beautiful description? Remember the, the, the picture that is there in, in Ezekiel uh, chapter 1 concerning those uh, four living creatures, those representations of the servants of God that they shine like burning coals of fire and how that should describe us in our service to God. And so we see in Ezekiel's vision of the glory of God that God is glorified through His servants. And then we see the uh, four wheels and as I said, starting out, people have made the biggest mess out of those four wheels that you'd ever want to see. Even, even to the point of saying that it's UFOs. You know, you got the wheel and a wheel within the wheel, and that's, you know, the, it's, it's silliness. When you look at the picture, it, it makes it very clear. You had the, the, the cherubim with their wings touching and facing out so that they didn't turn when they moved. They went this way and then they went that way and they went that way and they didn't turn and go. They went straight like that. And whichever direction they went, you could see all four faces. Those four faces that represent the glory of God. And then you've got the four wheels in verses 15 to 21. It says, Now as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their workings was like the color of beryl, and all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they moved, they went toward any one of four directions. They did not turn aside when they went. And so the wheel within the wheel is the wheels cross. So they go this way and they go this way. That's the wheel within the wheel with the wheels crossed like that. So they can go in any direction without turning. And so he says, When they moved, they went toward any one of four directions. They did not turn aside when they went. As for their rims, they were so high, they were awesome. And their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, because there the Spirit went. And the wheels were lifted together with them. For the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them. For the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels." And so you've got this uh, description of the four wheels. And the wheels represent God's providential working in the world. See, the, 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 the wheels are, are, are motion. And you've got the, the, the four directions of the wheels. The number four in, here in, in Ezekiel and in other places of prophecy, in uh, 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 biblical numerology, which is something else people get pretty far-fetched with. The number four simply refers to, to uh, completeness, fullness, like the uh, uh, four corners of the earth. That means the whole earth, the completeness of it. 
The four points of the compass. Again, it's talking about completeness, the fullness of it. And so the, 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 the four wheels, the wheel within the wheel, and going in any of the four directions is God's providence throughout all of creation. They showed awesome motion in verse 18. As for their rims, they were so high, they were awesome. And their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. And they showed tireless energy. In verse 21 it says, When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And they represent God's tireless work in His providential care of His people. You have the wheels within the wheels. And so just as the living creatures had four faces to look in four directions, each wheel could move in any of four directions. God is active in the affairs of man. And there is nowhere He cannot move. God's servants should be moving throughout the earth, carrying out His will. And then you've got the eyes in the wheels. You know, uh, there's a few places in the Bible where it talks about being full of eyes, and uh, we sing that song sometimes. All-seeing eye. There's an all-seeing eye. Talking about God's omnipotence, His omnipresence. He is everywhere all the time. And there is nothing that He does not see. If you look over at Psalm 139, beginning with verse 7. In Psalm 139 and verse 7, it says there, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light upon me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both like to you. And the psalmist gives that beautiful description of God's omnipresence. He's everywhere all the time. You know, sometimes we, we might get the idea that we can go somewhere where people we know don't see us. And, and we're out from underneath the watchful eye of family or friends at home or, or, or home church. And, and we can get out away from those people and we can do things that we wouldn't normally do at home. You know, uh, doing foreign mission work, I saw preachers go to other countries and do things in those other countries that they would never dream of doing here. And why would they do that? And, and, and people, people will say, well, it's because uh, uh, they're out from underneath the watchful eye of their home congregation, and so they think they can get away with those things. But how can we ever forget that we're never out from under the watchful eye of God? He sees everywhere. It doesn't matter where we go. As the psalmist says, it doesn't matter how high we go, how low we go. It doesn't matter how dark it is. God can see us there. He sees what we do. He hears what we say. And so there's never anywhere where our faithfulness to God should waver. Ever. He is omnipresent. As the, the, the wheels full of eyes here uh, magnify so powerfully, over in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 24, the prophet Jeremiah, again, a contemporary of Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah was still preaching back in, in Jerusalem while Ezekiel was preaching to the captives in captivity. And Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 23 and verse 24, 
Can anyone hide himself in secret places? So I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? Well, of course, a couple of rhetorical questions. A rhetorical question is a statement in the form of a question. He's not really asking a question there. He's making a statement. And if you were to turn that into a statement instead of a rhetorical question, it would say, there is no place where you can hide from God. His glory fills all the heaven and earth. He sees everywhere. He is omnipresent as the wheels within wheels filled with eyes so powerfully demonstrate. And then you have the the spirit of the living creatures in the wheels, it says. The wheels moved in perfect unity and harmony with the four living creatures. And certainly exemplifying to us that all of God's plans, all of His providence works in complete harmony. Likewise, uh, His servants should function in complete unity with His plans. His servants should, should operate in complete unity, in oneness with His work, with His Word, in the way that He gave for things to work. Jesus prayed for it in John chapter 17, beginning with verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And so you have the wheels within wheels and full of eyes, moving in perfect unison with the living creatures, signifying the perfect unison of God's people with one another and with His plans. And then it begins in uh, verse 22, talking about the firmament. In Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, The likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. And under the firmament, their wings spread out straight, one toward another. Each one had two which covered one side, and each one had two which covered the other side of the body. When they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters. Like the voice of the Almighty, A tumult like the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. Whenever they stood, they let down their wings. And so you have this this, uh, firmament described above the head of the four living creatures and how they moved underneath that firmament, uh, signifying the, the authority of God, God's glorious authority is exemplified there. It was above them, over them. They were in submission to God's authority. They were operating under God's authority. You have the awesome crystal there. Certainly it reminds us of the crystal sea in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6 where the elders fell down before that crystal sea and cast their, their crowns down and, 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 and uh, worshipped God and praised God around that crystal sea signifying purity. It says in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 11 having the glory of God Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Talking about the purity of the church, the the cleanness of the church as we've talked about in other lessons. And so that crystal likely signifying purity. The living creatures were were under the firmament. They They were active under the authority of heaven. They acted under the authority of heaven's voice the Word of God. And then, the last part of that vision, the throne of God above the firmament. It begins in verse 26. 
and says, And above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne, an appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward I saw as it were the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward I saw as it were the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Certainly, uh, the throne doesn't take a whole lot of interpretation. God's kingship is uh, uh, signified there. God's glorious sovereignty is symbolized there in that throne. His kingship over the universe, His absolute rule and sovereignty. And then you see the one on the throne, the appearance of a man. Again, there, there's a, a great deal of, of parallel in these verses with Revelation. It says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 13, And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band, and so you have uh, Christ described there, the likeness of the Son of Man. And in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25, we read there as Daniel is uh, receiving his revelation, says, Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. As uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar looked into that burning, fiery furnace and saw not Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego alone in there, but one like the Son of Man walking around in there. And so we have God on His throne, surrounded by a rainbow, which is a reminder of God's mercy. You remember in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 13, God sealed His covenant with man to never again destroy the earth by water with a rainbow in the clouds. And so anytime people would look at that rainbow in the clouds, they would see a symbol of mercy, a symbol of God's promise. The righteous were separated by the flood. And so the righteous would be separated in Ezekiel's day by the captivity. And so the righteous remnant today is separated from the world by baptism in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. And so that rainbow should always be a reminder of God's mercy. Certainly for us, the mercy of God in the scheme of redemption, the plan of salvation, as we have the opportunity to hear His Word and believe what it teaches about Christ and His kingdom, believing that, repenting of our sins, and confessing that we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And making that confession with the mouth unto salvation, being baptized into Christ, to have our sins washed away by His blood, we have a constant reminder of His mercy. And so, in summary of that vision, and I, we went through it really fast, and there's a whole lot there that we could spend a whole lot of time on. But in summation, we see the four living creatures representing God's glorification through His servant. We see the, the four wheels representing God's tirelessness and His providential care for His servants. We see the firmament representing God's sovereignty. He is above all and directs the affairs of His servants. And then we see the throne of God. He is the sovereign ruler of the universe and will have mercy on His servants who follow His will. It may be this evening that as you look at this example of God's glory, this, this uh, vision of God's glory that Ezekiel first gave to the children of Israel in captivity, those children of Israel who had forgotten about God's glory, and you've been reminded of it. You need to repent. You need to be restored. It may be you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ to, to uh, come, come into that 
glorious place of His mercy and care by being baptized into Christ. And you need to do that this evening. Whatever your need is, we pray that you'll come while we stand and sing.